I'm in for Joy Reid tonight. We begin the readout in Ukraine, where the situation on the ground is increasingly dire as Russian forces continue their invasion from the north, east, and south. This comes as civilian deaths continue to mount from Russian shelling, multi-launch rocket systems, and airstrikes. Now, Ukrainians in the southern city of Mariupol have been under assault for days as Russia continues to bomb the city, knocking out power, water, and heating supplies. Now, this presents residents from fleeing. One regional official warned that the city is on the brink of humanitarian disaster. Now, with the southern city of Kherson under Russian control, Putin has now set his sights on a city that could be used to stage a ground assault on the major port city of Odessa. That's according to a senior U.S. defense official. According to Defense Department officials, 92 percent of Russia's pre-stage military is now inside Ukraine. Now, that's up 2 percent from yesterday. The massive Russian armored column threatening Kyiv for days remains stalled outside the capital. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby confirmed that reports that the 40-mile-long convoy has been halted. This is halted by Ukrainian forces. Take a listen. We also have indications that the Ukrainians have struck the convoy elsewhere and on their own uh, uh, on, uh, on vehicles. We do believe that, that the actions by the Ukrainians have, in fact, stalled that convoy and certainly slowed it down, uh, stopped it in some places. Uh, but we also think that, uh, you know, that it, it's also a, of a piece of Russian challenges that they've had just in terms of their own physical ground movement, sustainment, logistics. They're running out of fuel. They're, we still believe that in, in some cases they're running out of food for their soldiers. In a call with the U.N. Secretary General, the Russian defense minister said that talks with Ukraine have not moved forward. Now, Vice President Kamala Harris is now scheduled to travel to Poland and Romania next week. Meanwhile, Russian troops have seized, seized the largest nuclear power plant in Ukraine. This is the largest in Europe. This is after a middle-of-the-night attack set part of the plant on fire and immediately raised global fears of a nuclear catastrophe. Today, the U.N. Security Council held an emergency meeting to discuss the attack and condemn the ex escalation. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield warned that the world narrowly, narrowly averted a major disaster. Take a listen. By the grace of God, the world narrowly averted a nuclear catastrophe last night. We all waited to exhale as we watched the horrific situation unfold in real time. During the meeting, Ukraine's ambassador urged the Security Council to call for a ban on all flights over Ukrainian airspace. But Secretary of State Antony Blinken pushed back, noting that a no-fly zone could lead to a full-fledged war in Europe. In a late-night address, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, visibly angry, slammed NATO for refusing a no-fly zone, saying that all the people who die from this day forward will also die because of you. Now you have to see him to understand the anger. Take a look. Усі люди, які загинуть від цього дня, загинуть також і через вас, через вашу слабкість, через вашу роз'єднаність. Meanwhile, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg confirmed reports that Russia has deployed cluster bombs. In a statement, G7 foreign ministers responded, saying that those responsible for the indiscriminate assaults on innocent civilians must be held accountable for war crimes. Let's get into it. Joining me now, NBC News correspondent Cal Perry. He's live in Lviv, Ukraine. And Ben Solomon, correspondent for Vice News in Odessa. Um, I want to start with you, Cal. Uh, you're in Kyiv, and I just want to paint the picture for our viewers of what we've seen. The scenes that have been coming out of Ukraine have been quite scary. There are scenes that have blanketed our screens with civilian casualties. Uh, three schools were shelled, as I'm sure you well know. We saw one of them with a gaping hole inside of the building, a nuclear power plant, as we just said, under control. Um, paint the scene for what it's like in Lviv right now for our viewers. Well, look, where I am in the western part of the country, uh, this is a city that's dealing with a refugee crisis, a city uh, that is reflective of the violence through crowds of people lost, confused, shocked by what they're seeing in places like Mariupol, in places like Kyiv, in places um, in the eastern part of the country. And in the eastern part of the country, as you've laid out, we're now seeing the Russians surround civilian areas, choke them off, um, and start shelling them, either indiscriminately or targeting civilians that, according to the U.S. State Department, 
Department. And this is a Russian tactic that we've seen. It's something that people in this country feared was coming, and it now seems to have arrived. We saw this in Chechnya in 2000. We saw it in Syria a couple years ago. And when you, when you listen to that Pentagon briefing, um, and we hear the discussions about those Russian columns being bogged down and the supply chains then being bogged down and hit, um, these columns are, are slowing down, but they're not stopping. In Mariupol, where I know we have somebody who's going to talk about this, the city, the city seems to be choked off, um, and people can't leave. And this is a place that doesn't have power, doesn't have water, where there's no heat. And this is what we're seeing play out across the country. It's leaving people here wondering, frankly, if Kiev is going to be remembered like Aleppo. And, and you have to remember, in this part of the country where I am, you have men dropping their families off at the border and then returning to the fight, some of them with no military experience, some of them uh, civilians who are not part of this military, and that's who's fighting this war. You, you chronicled what NATO is dealing with, not wanting to start a wider conflict. Well, the reality of that is, and they're, they're thinking about saving lives across Europe and avoiding a wider conflict, the, the reality is, without a no-fly zone, you have civilians fighting against the Russian army, um, and, and neither side seems to be willing to give, and, and civilians, as is so often the case, are going to pay the heaviest price, Tiffany. So I just want to um, ask to make it clear for our viewers, Cal, how far is Lviv from this uh, convoy, this Russian convoy that is alleged to have been stalled by uh, Ukrainians? I'm 350 miles from the capital of Kyiv, and that convoy is still about 40 kilometers from Kyiv. Um, so it's on the other side of the country from where I am. And that's one of the things that's so unnerving for people who have fled the violence in the east is they come to a place where I am in Lviv. It's supposed to be safe. It was supposed to be the fallback position for uh, diplomats, for civilians. And we have air raid sirens here every day. Now, we haven't had an attack here. There hasn't been any airstrikes. But it just kind of is an indication that people in this country, people who didn't think there would be a war even a week and a half ago, are now terrified that the entire country is eventually going to be engulfed in violence, Tiffany. That's quite, uh, quite a scary scene, uh, Cal. I want to bring you in, Ben, uh, in Odessa. We, we've seen the protests uh, all across Russia. Uh, people have been arrested, risking their lives uh, protesting. Paint the scene for what's happening in Odessa this evening. Well, here in Odessa, the, the situation is much different than many other parts of the country, but also very similar. Um, you know, we're, people here are watching this Kyiv, they're watching the situation in Kharkiv, where bombing is becoming more regular, and they're kind of waiting for that to come here. Uh, Odessa is a important port city. It's uh, the city that kind of has one of the, the biggest port in the country and the third largest city in the nation. And why it's so important for Russia to take is both economically, if they control that port, they have a huge cutoff from the uh, Ukraine government, but also if they take this city they really control the south of the country. Uh, being able to move forces easily in and out of the water is a big move for them. I mean, you know, one could argue that one of the reasons that they pushed to take Crimea in 2014 is similar in just kind of being able to control that south. Now, as you know, Kharkiv is being bombed, as Kiev is being so, like, uh, attacked and uh, so regularly, you know, a place like Odessa is really preparing. So when you walk through the streets here, when you talk with people, uh, it's still calm. Um, people are still going out, you know, just today I met somebody who had just come from the dentist. The dentist was still open. Uh, but there's kind of an undercurrent of fear. You know, they're setting up hedgehogs, which are anti-tank defenses all around the city. Uh, these uh, people are, uh, volunteers are all going to the beaches where kids used to play, packing these sandbags to distribute all around the city uh, at checkpoints and kind of building up the deployments to defense. So it's tense. You can kind of feel that soon these problems will start. But for now, while we're waiting for them to start, there's still a sense of, you know, life has to go on and the preparations have to continue. Uh, as you were talking, our viewers were able to see the scenes of uh, people there preparing um, for an impending battle. Thank you so much, Cal Perry and Ben Solomon. Please stay safe, and we'll check back in with you this hour if there's any breaking news coming from either of you. Thank you so much. I want to bring in now Naveed Jamali. He's a Newsweek editor and former FBI double agent and author of How to Catch a Russian Spy. Uh, Naveed, very happy to have you here this morning. These are very scary scenes that we see uh, coming out of Ukraine. Um, you know, I'm I'm trying to look at this from President Zelensky's point, uh, from, from his perspective. And, you know, he's visibly angry with NATO, as you just saw. And you understand that because it was just two weeks ago when he was standing on the world stage saying, hey, I've got 200,000 troops at my border and the world needs to help. Um, I, 
what should we be doing for Ukraine right now? Because I have to tell you, for people who don't wake up and read eight papers before the sunrise, it kind of looks like the world is just standing by watching as we watch Putin lay waste to these cities where women and children and families live. You're absolutely right. It's a terrible situation. It's already a human tragedy. It's unfolding. And I think President Biden specifically is tasked with a, you know, a really almost impossible task, and that is to help the people of Ukraine, to support President Zelensky, but also to keep the U.S. and, frankly, NATO out of a war with Russia. You know, this is a real challenge. We've heard a lot about no-fly zones. President Zelensky asked the U.S. and NATO and both refused a no-fly zone. It's important to understand that if we send combat troops, while they're on the ground or within the air, they're going to come in conflict with Russian forces. And that is undoubtedly going to lead to escalation and war between the two countries. So we just can't do that. But your question about what can be done, and, you know, this is something we've reported on quite a bit. We have quite a strong feeling that there is a gray area for covert action. That is to say, U.S. military via the CIA to help Ukrainians, not just with weapons, but to do things that allow for plausible deniability. And this is perhaps the greatest area where the U.S. and perhaps NATO and other forces can get in. Look, we've seen the Ukrainians use Turkish drones. You know, you never know who's flying those drones. There is things that can be done. It's unfortunately, or I should say fortunately, we're not going to necessarily hear about a lot of this stuff because it probably falls under that covert action.